Welcome to the Talk and Chatter Experience, powered by Gasoline Alley, Harley Davidson. Today's guest is proud mother, world champion boxer, and gym owner, Shotgun Shannon O'Connell. Welcome. Thank you for having me. No worries. Who's Shannon? Wow. Where do you start? Um, so I grew up in Adelaide. Yep. I, um, my, my dad died as in a Speedway um, solo accident when I was two. Um, so um, my mum turned to all the wrong things and, and, and became a heroin addict and ended up dying as when I was an adult. So I, I grew up in a hard life, um, which I guess towards the end drove me to boxing. Um, boxing's hard. So I sort of went, hard's what I know. Like I, I became obsessed with, I, I, I guess I've got an addictive personality personality the same as my mum so I became addicted to boxing in the same way that she became addicted to drugs it, it masked all the pain that I'd been through and, and things like that so um yeah that's that's how shotgun sort of created <laughs> that was like the birth of it basically yeah hey? yeah and um when when did you like you were born in Adelaide but you're obviously up here now what sort of age group was that when you came up I didn't start boxing until 20 after I had um done all the wrong things drugs partied everything wrong and it was it was actually somebody saying she's going to be just like her mother that made me sort of dig my heels in and and change my life um so I got into boxing it's it was hard for me to do boxing in Adelaide because all of my friends were still partying um so I got out of Adelaide boxing is a lot bigger in Adelaide now than what it was but it was nothing when I first left so I came to Queensland because it was bigger and better up here at the age of 20. Wow that's a um would that be counted as a late start in boxing? Massive. Like yeah. my son boxes. He's been boxing since he was, well, he had his first fight when he was 10. So I just think if I've done this since 20, imagine what you can do. Imagine the skill set that you could have it. Yeah. And, that, that and that's age. what I say to a lot of girls, especially a lot of girls coming through the gym and things like that. Like I started when I was 20 and look what I've achieved. Are you noticing that, that uh, there's a lot younger, younger people coming through the gym? Um, absolutely. Probably not. I, for some reason, I don't have a lot of young people in my gym. I, I do get a lot of, a lot more adults. Um, but I have seen a lot, there's a lot of gyms around who have a lot of talented kids. Yeah. Right. I wonder what that is. Do you think the skills like have actually developed over the last say 20 years of boxing? Like they're refined better? Um, I think there's, it's become a lot more based on skill rather than boxing being a bully's bullies sort of sport where you just you know you're getting in the ring bashing each other like yeah. there's there's so much skill involved in boxing there's so much technique and, and discipline and 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 it's so important for kids to learn that kind of thing these days is discipline be one of the main things about boxing 100 percent. yeah like i mean even as a 20 year old like my 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 first trainer created Sunday morning trainings just so I would stop going out on a Saturday night before really? training. He, he was like, it's a compulsory training session, nine o'clock Sunday morning. Um, the discipline involved, like, you know, when I'm in a fight prep and, and people want to go out for dinner, people want to go out for coffee, I can't. I, I've, I've, I've got a plan, I have to stick to it and, and nothing else matters. Well, it's, it's such a, um, it is the most disciplined sport. Yeah, I hundred percent. Boxing is is ninety percent discipline. And it's not just sport; it's a it's a lifestyle at that point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. How did you like? How did you fall into a trainer at that time? Like you got to twenty. How did you find a trainer? You've established in a new place. How does that happen? So my grandparents, um, who my my dad's parents, um, they always stayed around the speedway. I guess that was their way of holding on to my dad. And um, my first trainer, Terry Fox, actually rode speedway with my dad before he died um, and he was a boxing trainer. So my grandparents took me down to his gym yeah. and he's a very hard man. So um, I started my career with him. And I don't, I don't want to touch too much on your dad's stuff because you're two years old, but is that Speedway solo motorcycle Speedway? Yeah. Correct, eh? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah, so he was, um, he dedicated his whole life to that, to Speedway and I love it I love I like even I go down to Adelaide now I take my kids there and, and I want them to experience you know that side of my dad um I don't have any hate I I I, I would probably say yes I'm I'm afraid of bikes I'd probably be petrified if my son got on the back of a bike but it's that's life I mean my dad could have died crossing the road and getting hit by a car yeah. it, he he died doing what he loved wow it's yeah yeah, it's a it's a huge one, hey. It's yeah. a huge, huge thing. I guess you've had a lot of time to digest it over your 
your life now. Yeah, and I and I also believe like my dad's name was Kevin O'Connell, so I've got KO on my number plate. Uh, I'm on my number plate on my <laughs> mouth guard. Yep. I did have it on my number plate on my cars, um, but I have it on my mouth guard. I've got his I've got his picture tattooed on my arm. I've I've got his number was seventy eight. A lot of people think that that's when I was born. No, I'm not that old. Um, but his number was seventy eight. So I I believe that everything I do, it's it's he's with me and yeah. and a lot of when I first started was to I felt like when my mum turned to drugs and did all the wrong things my, my dad was a saint and she really dragged his name through the dirt by the way she grieved his death um so my main goal was to make his name proud again um that's not my goal now because I believe I've done that yeah. now it's more about creating my own legacy and and you're you're well and truly on your way to that. Yeah, I think I've I think I've surpassed a, my dad. <laughs> so you yeah you've killed it with that part. You've nailed it. So tell me this: um, when did you start your first amateur bout? So you got up here at twenty. Well, how long did it take? Um, so I I started in Adelaide, yeah. and I literally had my first spa in a gym three yeah. weeks before my first fight. That was it. My first fight was like. I felt like I had 10 kilo weights on my hands. It was disgusting to watch when I watch now. Yeah. But at the time, like there was no no feeling like it. Like I was shaking. I was nervous. I was, there was just nothing like it. So you remember this? like? Yeah. I yeah. remember it like it was yesterday. And I was 20 years old. My whole family was there. Yeah. It was it was the most nerve wracking thing. And to be honest, like when, when I see young kids, especially girls, boys, whatever, go through the nerves now, yeah. I can still tell them I've had 70 plus fights and I still go through those nerves. Like I was still nearly come to tears before a fight. I fought what nearly two months ago in Townsville. I was still nearly in tears before I fought. I was still, those nerves still are so overwhelming, but the feeling of accomplishment afterwards, you forget about the nerves. Wow. What do you, <laughs> what do you like the week before a fight? Probably a bit moody. Yeah. You're probably better off asking my partner or my yeah. kids that one. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm fine, but I don't think they think I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just be so many emotions going through. I yeah. Think, you know. And and it, it is it's it's a different like boxing. You're a different breed. Like I'm not preparing myself for a game of footy. I'm not preparing myself for a game of netball. I'm preparing myself for battle. Yeah. And and I guess your head starts to prepare yourself like. Like you, every every doubt goes through your head. You've got to push them out. Every every thought, every anything that could go wrong, anything that could go right, you've got to visualize things and um, yeah, the, the the emotions that you go through before a fight are, are crazy, but it's all part of it. Yeah, it's just, and that's probably the exciting part too. At the time, it's not exciting, but when you think about it later, it is. <laughs> yeah, you just look back at that and think, oh, wow, look at the preparation yeah. that I put in and I completed. Like I'm pretty sure before every fight I've ever had, I've sat there and I thought, why am I doing this? Whose idea was this? And then I get out the ring and I'm like, when's the next one? <laughs> really? Yeah. Is it that quick? Like, yeah. <laughs> when, when can we do that again? <laughs> so so at, and at 20, that first fight, the amateur fight, did you win it? I did. That must have been an incredible feeling. Yeah, I did. I, I won it and then um, the girl wanted a rematch. So I fought her again three weeks later and I stopped her. So yeah. I um, got past those nerves and, and, and bettered myself. Were you were you physically fit at that point? I thought I was. Yeah. Um, I guess you get to a point where in boxing you train hard and you always think that no one's training as hard as you. But as I've come through the years of boxing, like I've been boxing 17 years and – I think 10 years ago, I used to think I was training hard. I used to think I was fit and I was nothing compared to what I am now. Wow, really? Yeah. Like it's crazy. You think that you're fit. You think that you do it. You think that no one else can match you. But at the time, like there, there's always someone training harder than you. And and the fitness that I am now is a million times fitter than what I even thought I was back then. That's incredible to, to think of, um, you know, at 20 years old, you, you just think that you're at your absolute peak. Yeah. everything but now 30 mid 30s whatever late you, 30s you're at you you're <laughs> at you but you're at your absolute absolute peak fitness now yeah absolutely like i'm i'm fitter stronger mentally more there like i'm i'm um happier what do you do mentally do you do any like you know meditation stuff or you said visualization before 
of you what do. Yeah. Um, I so sometimes I'll be running on a treadmill and and you know certain songs will come on and and I picture myself with my arms up in the air. Or, I mean, to be honest, I've pictured myself getting knocked out as well. But you, you try and block that part <laughs> out. Um, I, I picture myself with my arms up in the air and it, it gets me to a point where I choke up. Like I, I'll be mid run and I'll be like just wanting to burst into tears because the emotional part of it it's just i'm just so passionate about what i do just and it'd be just pure elation you know you're just yeah. so elated it's um and and it's not only for me it's not only passion about the sport it's passion about life um the life that i could have lived and the life that i did live as a child compared to the life that i'm now giving my children and the life that i'm living myself it it it's a completely different like I sometimes I sit there and I think the things that I went through as a child my kids I don't know how they'd live through it mm. yeah it'd be yeah it'd be very different a very different life to what you've got now yeah 100 percent, definitely like I mean I lived in housing commission my whole life I've now I've got a mortgage I've got a I've got a I mean it's a it's a townhouse it's a unit but it's mine yeah I've never had that in my life. Like we were housing commission. We, we were kicked out of them all the time. We were living in hostels. Like I, the things that I've got and I've been able to give my kids now, like my kids have just, both of them just went through private primary schools and and not a chance would, I mean, I think I went through to a private primary school when I was little because my mum made them feel sorry for her because my dad died. Like, wow. <laughs> like she never paid fees in her life. <laughs> so... It's it, you've like the accomplishments. Uh, so, excuse me. The accomplishments inside the boxing ring are one thing, but those external accomplishments like that must be must feel pretty huge then. Yeah, for sure. And I guess the accomplishments inside the boxing ring is like um, the finishing touch. Yep. Like everything that I work hard towards, everything that I put my body through, everything. I mean, my kids obviously. You know, I, I don't. If I'm in a hard fight prep we don't have as much fun on the weekends and, and I'm tired. I'm probably cranky. They don't eat McDonald's every second night. Like some kids might do like, you know, we, we all go through it together. Yep. And, um, the, the final touches is that, uh, that getting your hand raised at the end of the fight. So you get the, you get the rewards of your kids having a great life and then you get the rewards of winning the fight and yeah. not as well. And I mean, there's been times like I've got a 20 month old baby and my, my son, when I was pregnant and I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to be a mum. Yep. Um, my, at the time, 13 year old son begged me. He said, mum, I'll stop boxing. I don't want to box. I want you to box. I'll look after Felix. I'll, I'll, I'll look after the baby. You keep boxing. I want you to keep boxing. Wow. They're so, so passionate about it. Yeah. Your kids. Yeah. So what age, what age are your kids? You got a... I've got a... 15? 14, 13 and 20 month old. How, how, does, how does it feel going to the, the having the new new baby, I guess, the youngest baby? In, in it, it's a fair separation of age. How did that feel? Like you've boxed the whole time through. Is it different now? Um, it's probably easier now. And my son, my baby is obsessed with boxing. So this is Felix? <laughs> yeah, Felix. Yep. Felix is obsessed. Like you've never seen a kid obsessed with boxing the way this kid is. He, he's he been in the gym since he was three days old. He loves it. Like I say to him sometimes, I pick him up from daycare and I say, do you want to go home today? Nope. Do you want to go to the gym? Gym. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Okay. So, so he's he's in. He's obsessed. I don't know. I feel like I'm going to be stuck in boxing for the rest of my life just because when he's old enough, like it's going to be the longest ten years <laughs> until he's old enough to fight. But um, yeah, he's obsessed. And my my oldest son helps with him a lot. He's you know they they're all. He, my oldest son is a very talented boxing a uh, boxer. He's um he's kind of going through a bit of a an age at the moment where I don't want to push him into it. I want it to be his decision that he keeps yep. training. So he's having a little bit of a break at the moment, but he's a very talented young boy. And he's at that sort of age where you start to make decisions on where you go and that, isn't he too? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, the, yeah, he's that age. Yep. And is it 10 years old for boxing in Australia? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, Queensland. Um, Queensland yeah. So I think Queensland's 10. Every other state is 12. New South Wales is 14. All right. Yeah. Fair so, difference. I mean, I guess we're, we're very privileged up here because by the time, like, he's having his first fight at 10, by the time other kids are 12, he's yep. had 10 fights and they're having their first. So, the we've, been, we've been very privileged up here that 
they let them start so early. Like he went to um, the Australian titles last year, which was the first year he was old enough and he had three fights in three days and I don't think he dropped around. Really? Yeah. Where was the Australian titles last year? On the Gold Coast. On the Gold Coast, yep. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. So, and what's the, you know, what's the level? Did, did you get to go? Like, were you away or? I, I was there. I was actually surprised. It was the first time in his 30-something fights that I wasn't in his corner. Yep. So, I was a nervous wreck because when I'm in his corner, it's I'm in there with him and I've got to focus and I don't get a chance to get nervous. Yep. When I wasn't in his, nerv- in, in his corner, I was a nervous wreck. So, I think he probably liked it though. It, it must be strange. And it was a question I had sort of written down as well. When you go to a fight, just as a spectator, how does it feel? I probably dodge a lot more punches watching fights than I do in my own fights. <laughs> <laughs> People hate sitting behind me because I sit there and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. So, um, yeah, I, I do. I love watching. I love watching the boxing. I love watching more so people that I know box. Yep. I'm not the type of person that could sit and watch boxing on TV all day. If I don't know them, I don't care. Yep. Like I don't obsess over boxing. Like a lot of people have said, you know, who do you study? I don't study anyone. I'm me. And and I I trust my trainers enough that they're going to fix the things that I need to fix in my own style. And I'm not going to copy someone else's style. That's, a, that's a, um, a cool way of doing it. Like there's only a few people that probably like in, in mo- multiple sports – not have the confidence, but can actually say that. Everyone's yeah. like, oh, this is my pure influence. I study them. That's my thing. Not many people actually say yeah, that. Yeah, a lot. Of, and like I've been, um, a lot of people have said to me like, oh, do you watch this person? Do you? I don't even know who that person is. Like, and is there a female that you look up to? No. no. I, I can tell you right now, and this might make me sound really cocky, but my motivation is me. Yeah. I changed my life. I made, I created who I am now and that's my motivation. If I stop doing what I'm doing, then I'm failing. So you just got to keep going. Yeah. How long did you stay amateur for? Uh, I was amateur for nine years. Was so that was that really hard? Like, was the amateur ranks just as hard as the pro ranks, or how did that work? Um, because you're at have the time. Good so, so when I was in the amateurs, it was only just um, when I when I turned pro, it was only just um, put into the Olympics. So women weren't even looked at looked at like we paid I went to world championships and things like that we paid for our own trips we everything was nothing was funded not like we everything was paid for everything we had to come up with ourselves we had to organize ourselves I'd been on trips I went to world championships in Barbados and I met the coach when we got there and then he had to corner me for world championships so um not, female boxing was never as big as what it is now so you know like i i guess you can say the girls now are really lucky that they've got the support and the backing that they have especially i mean you know with people like sky nicholson winning gold at the com games and and things like that like we're getting more support um but as an amateur i never even i didn't even like pro boxing as soon as i turned pro now i'm like what was i thinking i should have turned pro first (laughs) (laughs) so previously to all those fights yeah. I mean, I had 50 amateur fights, which yeah. isn't much compared to the girls these days, but at the time was huge. And, but yeah, definitely, it definitely created who I am as a pro. Like I, I fight completely differently as a pro is what I did as an amateur, but it also gives me the skill set to be able to mix things up. How, how like, how, it's not that long ago, you know, like you're talking about this with the funding and going over to Barbados and that, like realistically, it's not that long ago. It's 10 years ago. It's not that long, is it? <laughs> no, in the grand scheme of wasn't. things, like you look at it and go, I can't believe how much it's advanced yeah. in 10 years. Yeah. And I mean, like, so 2012, I believe, was the first time they introduced women to the Olympics. And um, at the time, they said they were taking the top eight in the world. Right. I was currently ranked number two in the world. So all I had to do was win at Australian level and I was going to the Olympics. They also told me that I would be moving to the AIS for six months and that was without question. And I said, well, that's not happening. I've got two kids and a mortgage. Yeah. Not happening. So I turned pro. Wow. That has changed. Like they don't actually now have to live at the AIS and that probably I could have put my foot down and changed it, but I don't regret turning pro. Yes, I may have been able to go to the Olympics, but I I feel like I've done more as a pro than what, what the Olympics to me would have meant. I know the Olympics means a lot to a lot of people, but I've done more as a pro to 
for me than yep. what the Olympics would have meant to me. You can sleep at night and not have to think, oh, yeah. I wish I could have done that or something. Absolutely. Yep. And what happens when you turn pro? Like, like, do you just one day just say, hey, I fill out this form and now I'm professional? What happens? What uh, yeah, happens? yeah, pretty much. Like, yeah. I know with like Muay Thai and, and MMA, like you have to gain the right. Mm-hmm. With um, with boxing, you could you don't have to even have an amateur fight. Um, you just have to be 18. Yep. Um, some countries you don't even have to be 18. Um, but yeah, you just register. I mean, obviously you've got to go through your medicals and everything like that and hope to God that you've got a coach that's going to match you with someone that's not going to knock your head off. Mm. Um, I had the amateur experience anyway, so I knew what I was getting myself into. And how was your first pro fight? Um, my first pro fight, I won by I think third or third round knockout. Um, and it, I loved it. I loved. Every, I literally got out the ring and I went. I can't believe I stayed amateur for nine years. <laughs> where was where was this at? Um, Gam Gambar- oh, Gambaris. 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 Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That and and that was it. Start of the pro career from that there. That was it. Yep. I had um, my first world title fight. I think it was my fifth or sixth fight. Was against um, <coughs> sorry, against um, Juan Mi Choi from Korea. <laughs> she was having like her seventh defense of her world title. I went up a weight division, um, but I, I had a crack and, and, you know, I had, I, I didn't win, but I did have Korean, South Korean judges come up to me afterwards and tell me that I got robbed. And I mean, it's not really the thing you want. It doesn't matter. Who yeah. cares? P- people can have an opinion. People can say, I got robbed. I got this, I got that. It doesn't matter. It's the judges that are sitting around the table that yep. judge the fight that matter. Um, but just to know that, I gave her a hard fight in my fifth fight and she was a six time world champion made it. I, I, I knew I was going to keep pushing and I was going to get that world title eventually. It's incredible credibility, isn't it? Yeah. To fight straight away in that. Hey, the Gambaro's fight. Do, do you remember what the wage was for the first pro fight? No idea. Yeah. What? No idea, but I do know that I have fought for peanuts most of my career. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was just yeah, I was wondering what that was at that at that point. Yeah, no. So like, um, when I first started, yep. which I mean years ago now, I think they get the get the novices are getting paid now, but it was literally I think two hundred dollars a round is what you were yep. averaged, and it was a six round fight, so I'm assuming I would have got twelve hundred bucks. Yep, a lot of effort to yeah. Twelve hundred bucks. I mean, like it? you you think now some guys are getting that around. Mm. I'm not. But some guys are. Yep. <laughs> so some of the say some of the fights at Townsville, that's that'd be pretty much a common sort of thing per round for some of the undercards at Townsville, hey? For what the? Ah, uh, the last fight that was, was your last fight that you did up there for some of the guys that might be around. Maybe sort of maybe for some of the guys, I yep. still got didn't get paid very much. Yep. Um, I know that the guys were getting it. Probably the 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 le- the the. Least paid after me, yep. probably got double what I got paid. It's so strange. Yeah. And yeah. still to this day, I'm told I, my, our fight, mine and Kylie's fight was fight of the night. And we got paid at least half of what they everyone else got paid. And you're still a professional athlete training the same. And probably I personally, I, I know a lot of people are going to sit there and go, yeah, whatever. But I believe that I deserve more. Like I'm not only training the same i'm also a single mother of three children Mm. i do get that there are other fathers out there that box but they have supportive wives that are looking after their children for them i i'm I'm a single mother of three children i run a business i i train twice a day i sometimes I, i i do i i believe that i do have it a bit harder than most and it doesn't it doesn't stop me from training as hard as i have to train is that more drive for you not really. It's kind of a bit disappointing, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, like I can't. I, c- I could never step into a ring and have that thought of I ate the wrong thing or I didn't run that extra two k's or like I would never step into the ring and know that I didn't give everything to get in that ring. So every time you commit to a fight, you know that you're always going to be the hundred percent prepared. Hundred percent, definitely. Yeah. And like I've taken like my last fight. Um, I know my opponent complained that she took the fight on short notice. Yeah. I also took the fight on short notice. Right. Like we had the same notice. We got told on the same day that the fight was on. Yeah. Um, I still, I did everything I had to do to make sure that I was ready for that night. And you came out pretty, um, 
pretty hard that night. <laughs> yeah, it was actually fun. Like I, I, I don't think I've ever had that much fun in a boxing ring. So I think, you know, after all these years, I feel like I'm definitely made for the big stage. Yeah. I don't think I would have been had that much fun if it was at a little show with 200 people there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. Like all credit to Kylie. She was tough, but I, I just don't believe that she was in the fight at all. Yep. You're, you're as an entertainment value, like sitting, watching a main event at home. It was an entertaining fight. Yeah. I thought, I thought so. I've watched it back and yep. I thought that I stuck my tongue out once. Apparently I did it probably once around, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, wow, I, I did that a lot more than I thought. But yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I got hit, but whatever. It's boxing. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. When you when you come through from from the pro rankings, say you went to Korea for that. How long was it before the um the title that you actually achieved? So um my fight after Korea. Yeah. I went and I fought an undefeated fighter in South Africa, and I won by I think seventh round knockout. Wow, and that was the title. And that was my first world title. Yeah. How how did, how is it like fighting in South Africa? It was a bit scary. They told me, they tried to intimidate me. I mean, my coach at the time was South African, so I sort of, I knew what to expect. Yep. Um, they did tell me that there was going to be like lions walking around the hotel and <laughs> they tried to really scare me, but I was like, I don't think that's happening. Um, but everyone over there was really supportive. Yep. Um, didn't matter the, the race, everybody, like the amount of photos that I had at the end of the fight with any anyone, everyone, like everyone thought it was amazing. It would have been. It's a pretty, um, pretty incredible place. Everyone that travels to South Africa says it's incredible. Yeah, and, and I yeah. mean, where we were wasn't the nicer part of South Africa, okay. but everyone was still so amazing to me. Like, I'd love, to, I'd love to go back and fight there. How did it feel in the title? Pretty cool, except yeah. <laughs> the girl that I fought, I hit her with a body shot. She got, ta- she actually got taken out on a stretcher, and we had to wait for all of that to happen before they gave me the belt. So I was like, bitch, get out of the ring. <laughs> I'm <gonna celebrate. laughs> Give me my belt. <laughs> was she all right afterwards? Uh, she was fine. She actually asked for a rematch the next day. Straight away? Yeah. Weird, but we didn't, obviously it didn't happen. But yep. yeah, I'm not sure. She she was never in the fight in any way. Like, she, yeah, she sort of ran around and, and I hit her with, I think it was a right rip, left rip, and she just folded. It was all over. I, I actually feel like... The punches were hard, but I feel like it was more she was embarrassed, which is why she got taken out on the stretcher. Oh, no. <laughs> Just because she talked it up so much. So she said that she was going to win, like no yeah. doubt. Oh yeah, she yep. was very confident. Yep. And she was an she was an undefeated fighter. She 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 had all the right to be confident. So you did Korea and then straight to South Africa. Yeah. What's been your, what has been your favorite uh, ring to box in? Um. Like, is there anything that stands out or favorite city as such? To Toronto was cool. Really? Um, yeah, it was it was really cool. Um, probably the coolest part of it was Lennox Lewis was the co-promoter. Yeah. And to have him come up to us the next day and say fight of the night on a big card, yeah. that was cool. Um, it also, I, I lost the fight, but I put up a war. I got dropped, she got dropped. It was just, it was a bloodbath. Yeah. Um, I feel like that was a fight that really made people open their eyes and and say wow this girl's the real deal yep what year what uh what year was this 2015 yep so um in saying that though i also fought on um joseph parker's undercard when he won his world title against ruiz yep um that was that was amazing i've fought on some good cards like that that particular one like i seen your photo on insta about that one when you were with ruiz yep and I'm like, wow, that, that's an incredible undercard to be on. Yeah, I've, I've fought on some really cool undercards. Like I fought on Jeff's undercards. Yep. I mean, um, win or lose, I've fought on his undercards. I fought on his undercard when he lost to Zarafa. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to fight on the one when he beat Zarafa, but um, I fought on, I've fought on his undercard when he, um, his first defense against Gary Corcoran. And it's it's been really cool. Like I've actually feel very lucky that me and Jeff have, done a lot of things side by side even though we're not even part of each other's camps yeah that's right it's sort of been a parallel the whole time hasn't it yeah and people think of us as like the duo from yep. brisbane but like we don't even train together yeah. <laughs> so we, we meet each other at the way and we're like hey hey jeff how are you so yeah it's yeah no it's very uh very interesting because like you see a lot of the press things and that come out it is yeah. it's the duo so yeah. i think it always is how how like at 20 years old did you ever think you'd be traveling the world doing what you've done absolutely not yeah not a chance I I didn't think that I I mean sometimes I sit back and I think wow like 
I, there's so many more things that I want to want to achieve, but from what I've come from to what I am now, wow. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, when I was in the amateurs, I was ranked number two in the world, in the, in the Olympic division. So that's pretty big. And I was like, yeah, but I want to be one. I want to, I want to be number one. And then I got to being ranked number two in the world in the pros, mm -hmm. but I want to be number one. And then I sit back and I think, number two is pretty damn good. It's number one's better, but number like I made number two in the world. <laughs> and the people that are number one, like, have probably held it for a long, long like. Yeah, they must be incredible. So a lot of the thing, like, not so much in the amateurs. In the amateurs, you really do earn your stripes. Yep. Um, in the pros, it comes down to a lot of who you know, who's paying for things. Um, money, money talks in pros. Yeah. And um, we've never really had that kind of a money backing where we can just buy wins. Mm. And, and I've always, I don't want that. I don't yeah. want to buy wins. I want to win wins. Yeah. You're, you're there to fight. Yeah. Yeah. Does, is that frustrating about boxing? Absolutely. It does my yeah. head in. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, there, there's, there's world champions out there that, yeah, they're good. Yeah. And they could win. The, the, the thing that frustrates me the most is they're good enough to win at their own division, but they'll defend their title against someone that's two divisions lighter than them. Mm. It steps up like you're that you're gonna you're gonna like four or five kilos heavier than this poor girl. Like, of course you're gonna beat them. Yeah. Like, but they're they're good enough to win at their own division. So fight the people in your own division and earn it. Keep the credibility there. Yeah. I mean, like um. No, no disrespect to anyone, but there's Amanda Serrano. She's, I think, a seven division world champion. Most of her world titles, and she's she's an amazing boxer. Like, yeah. like I'd love to fight her. Hard fight. Don't know that I win it, but I'd definitely give her a good crack. But majority of her divisions of her world titles that she's won, she's fought people out of the their, their division. So they offered me a fight once at junior welterweight which is like 63 and a half kilos. I was barely 63 and a half kilos when I was six months pregnant. Wow. So you had, had to climb up so much weight. Yeah. And I was like, well, okay, can we just, I'll take the fight, but can we take it at 55? Because that's where I'm comfortable. Yep. No. Yeah. <laughs> tell me this, with, with going up a weight class, how much, say you get, say two kilos, you, you go up. Yep. How does, it, how does it make you feel? Like, does it, does it slow you down a lot in that two kilos? Um, look, it doesn't because you generally sit more than two kilos above your division now. Like, I, I fight now. Well, my next fight's going to be at 53 kilos, 53.5. Yep. Um, I generally, most, my, most of my fights have been at 55. Yep. I sit at 60. Mm -hmm. So, I'm always losing that bit. So, yeah, if I had to only lose three kilos instead of five, yep. I don't think I'd feel the difference. But when you're fighting against an opponent that is usually sitting at 62, 63, 64. Yeah. They're getting back in the ring at 62, 63, 64, and I'm getting back in the ring at 59, 60. Yep. There's a difference. Huge difference. And do you, do you notice it, like, say, okay, so say you go up, have you ever had to go up five, six kilo class? Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you notice it yourself, like in your own speed or power? or? Um, no, because I've, I've not gone up there. I have not cut weight. Yep. But I always, you definitely feel better at your own fight weight. At your like natural you, weight. Yeah, yep. you feel, sh like even though if you're cutting fluid, it's not really your natural weight. Mm -hmm. It's your weight that you're, like, I, I mean, my my last weigh-in, I got, in the, got on the scales, I think I was 54.9. I got in the ring and I was 58 kilos. Wow. 24 hours later. So you're not, it's just, I think it's just a mental thing. You've had to cut the weight. You've had to put it back on. It's all part of the process. If you're not cutting the weight, are you taking it seriously? I don't know. Like it's not, it's yep. just the process just got messed up somehow mm. that you're not cutting that much weight. So it's not, it's not playing that part in your mind where you've got to do the hard work to then get the benefits. i got a lot of motorsport fans that listen to this show. It's sort of a semi motorsport show. Yep. Explain the days before a weigh in. Like what, what is cutting weight? Like say, say you go into weigh in at say 53 and a half kilos. Explain what happens 24 hours. So, well, uh, let's talk 55 because I haven't done 53 yet. Okay. Let's say 55 <laughs> kilos. So um, if I try and get – so I, I walk around, say, 59, 60. Yep. I try through my fight camp to get through to the week of the weigh-in, I try and get to about 57 kilos. Mm -hmm. So then 
the couple of days before I, it's pretty much about, for me, I know everyone does it differently, but for me, I, I lose a bit, I gain a bit, I lose a bit, I gain a bit. I make sure I'm losing more than I'm gaining. Yep. I cut out a lot of fluid. Yep. Majority of your last bit of weight cut is fluid. Mm-hmm. If I have to, I mean, my last fight, I went for, I put a sauna suit on. It was in Townsville, so it was hot. I put a sauna suit on, a track suit on, a t-shirt over this the This is top. the last fight two months ago? Yeah. Wow. I went for a probably half an hour jog and it was a jog, like a probably, yep. probably like a walking pace kind of a jog. Um, and I lost a kilo and that's just fluid. Wow. Um, a lot of people sit in saunas. Saunas to me make me want to just neck myself. Yep. <laughs> like I, I don't <laughs> understand people that sit in saunas for fun. Yeah. Like to me, I sit in a sauna and I'm like, can't breathe, dying. Yeah, I'm oxygen deprived. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, um, but yeah, I, I would rather run the weight off. And, and because yep. I'm quite lean naturally, I don't, ha- I, I think I feel like I live my life dehydrated anyway. So I don't have a lot of fluid to get off. But yeah, I lost a kilo just going for a 30 minute light jog yep. with a sweatsuit on. With a sweatsuit. As, as you've gotten older, um, how, how, how it, uh, has it gotten harder? To, to, to maintain that weight or trying to go get to the weight? Um, was it changed at all or has it been the same? I think I've gotten smarter. Okay. Yep. So um, my diet's different um, than when I was younger. I, I never used to understand salts and fluids and, and what foods hold fluid and things like that. Like mm-hmm. I think I've just gotten smarter. You know, like I, I do a lot of my training through the day while my kids are, you know, either at school or daycare and, um, so I eat carbs in the morning, then I train, then I eat carbs at lunch, then I train, and then I eat proteins at night. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really gaining, I'm not like, there's no point in me putting, having pasta or rice or anything at night when I'm not doing anything. Yep. So I guess I've just become smarter, but I've definitely don't cut weight as hard as I used to when I was younger. Right. I probably eat less McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> education. Yeah. <laughs> Pure education. Tell me about the bond between a trainer and a fighter. Um, so my, I, I have had a couple of different trainers over the yep. years. Um, my trainer right now, Luke Meldon, we are like, probably like, I would say best friends, brother and sister. Like, um, he's, that close. Yeah. yeah, I, when I, the way I look at it and the way I think every fighter should look at it with their trainer is when I'm getting in that ring, I'm trusting him with my life. Yep. He's got a towel in his hand for the, for a reason. He's seeing things that I can't see in there. He's telling me what to do differently. I've got to trust every single word that comes out of his mouth while I'm fighting. Um, You you also get to a point where he's the only voice I'm going to hear. Mm. Um, You know, there could be thousands of people screaming. I've been in, when I fought in Argentina, there was 12,000 people there screaming against me. Only voice I could hear was his. Um, You've got to have that bond with your trainer because... like I said, I'm trusting him with my life. And you spend so much time. I spend so much time with him, but also like, you know, we're, we're mates. Like, like we, he, he does things and, and, you know, we, we talk to each other and, um, he's, he really is like a best friend to me. Like if I had a problem outside of boxing, I would, he's probably one of the first people I'd ring. Luke would be one you'd turn to. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And, um, and, and, and I guess I would hope to think the same way goes for him. Like, um, I just think that the bond that we have is probably a lot stronger than a bond that some trainers have with their fighters. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, Luke is probably one of the best people that I've got in my life. Your first fight with Luke, how, how, do, you get, how do you create that bond for the first fight? Well, my first fight with, <laughs> with Luke, I stopped the girl in the first round. Mm. So I was like, well, we didn't really get to do much. No. Because we didn't even get back to the corner. <laughs> so um, my first real fight yep. with Luke was in Canada yep. when I was in an eight-round war. I got dropped in the first round. I was split. And it's the first time in 60-plus fights at the time that I'd ever had a cut. Wow. Um, this in Toronto. The, in Toronto, yeah. yeah. And um, I just, I think that was what made us. Mm. Like, sort of like adversity you, like yeah. that was a pr- like i watched that as well that was a pretty brutal fight eh? yeah like i had no choice but to trust him yep and and like i mean there's a photo of um me with blood coming down my face and him in front of me and i'm just looking at him like huh <laughs> <laughs> and and like i uh, you had i had no choice yep. i had to trust him either if i didn't trust him what was i going to do in there that's it and and that's where it's i guess that's where it all started and like, are you serious? Like, that's the only thing you say in Argentina. 12,000 people. 
that's the only thing you can you've just you're that into each other that's all you can hear um i mean to be honest you can you can hear things yep. but he's the main voice that i can hear um yep. i also i have um my other trainer steve mm-hmm. i can hear him um but i hear luke a lot more um but i guess it's and, and I say that to the fighters that I train. Like when I'm when we're sparring, I'm not yelling at them in sparring. Mm-hmm. I'm talking to them. They've got headgear on. They've got there's music going on, and I'm, and they're like, I can't hear you. I'm like, learn. Yep. <laughs> like you're gonna have to learn to hear my voice. Yep. Because my voice is the only voice that's gonna matter when you're in that ring fighting. Because yeah, everything else is irrelevant. Yeah. When you have a down day, and it, like say you have a, I don't know, something you, you've prepared 100. percent but the day comes and there's been, you know, something's happened throughout the day. How do you jump in the ring positively? Um, I've had a lot of down days. I fought in, in Argentina. I fought a week after my grandfather died. And oh. my pop was my dad's dad. So he basically raised me. Um, the reason I went to Argentina is because my nan told me, you better go because he would want you to go. So um, I buried him and literally the day after his funeral i'd gone on a plane to argentina once that first bell goes you're in there and you're in there i don't know what that was thanks Siri's Um, trying to tell us something yeah (laughs) um once you're in there you are in there and nothing else matters you've got to shut off and if you if you don't have that ability to shut off what what the world is happening outside then you're not a fighter Mm. um and and it same goes like you know i've had bad days at training I've had days at training where Lucas said, Shannon, go home. Like, no point in you being here. Piss off. And I come home the next day. I'm, I come back training the next day. I'm a different person. Um, and that's, I guess, that's a bond as well. Like yep. there's, there's, there's times where the only place I feel comfortable in life is in the ring. Like people have spoken to me about retirement and, and things like that. I'm not ready to retire. I feel great. I yep. feel... I, I'm at 37 years old. I feel better than I did when I was 27 years old. But one thing that I am scared of is I've created shotgun. Mm-hmm. And yes, I have kids. Yes, I have a business. But I don't know who I am if I'm not shotgun. Shotgun is this, is this I guess, superhero to some people mm. and, and to myself. I'm when I'm shotgun. I'm I'm in, I can do anything and I can push through anything and I can focus and and I don't know who I am with that when I'm not shotgun. It's like an alter ego. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What? Yeah. What? What do you? Yeah. What? What do you do? I guess there's no reason to retire while you feel good though. No, I, I, absolutely. And people like you know I've got kids, so people are like you've got to worry about your kids. We're like, well, if I start slurring my words, I'm pretty sure my coaches are going to tell me. Yep. I'll quit then. And you feel good. Within that side, hundred yeah. percent. Absolutely, yeah. It's yeah, it's one of those things. I guess, um, no matter what the sport, any athlete, the the bells keep ringing. Like people keep saying, "Oh, you should retire soon. You should retire yeah. soon." But why well, you feel good? What's the point? And you enjoy it. You know, when people talk to about, say, uh, Anthony Mundine. Mm-hmm. Yes, Anthony Mundine is past his prime, hundred yeah. percent. Great guy. I don't care what anyone has to say about him. Yeah. He's a really good person. He sat down with my son once and and a little while ago and he talked to him about choices in life and making the right choices and being different and and being a leader and not a follower and i've i've got so much respect for anthony mundine um but yeah should he give up should he hang up his gloves probably do i understand that he can't 100 percent. can he still fight yes he can yes he can. maybe not at the level he may not at the level that he and probably my only thing is he's taking hard fights and they're not good for him like Michael Zarafa, not a smart fight. I don't personally believe. I believe there's other fights that he, if he wants to stay in it, he could be fighting different fights. Mm. You know, it's an interesting one with Anthony Mundine. Anyone that's behind the scenes, like within different parts of sports and that, like he, he cops a lot of flack online. Or well, let's it, let's be honest, he brings it on. <laughs> but anyone that's behind who's actually spent time with Anthony Mundine. Has is, the same thing to say about him. Yeah, the best person in the world. Yeah, he yep. is. 110 million percent he is you know he does a lot he does a lot for aboriginal communities yep. he does a lot for kids um, my, my son's not aboriginal he sat down there for a good 10 15 minutes and people said to me i stayed away because i 
I wanted my son to really yeah. focus. But people have said to me like that they were nearly in tears with some of the things that that he was saying to to Coop. Like you know things about you know when he when he never drank when his mates were out drinking he wanted to be great so he made that choice to yeah. to be a different person and and he was encouraging Cooper to make this the right choices and and I thought 100% he's got my utmost respect and Anthony Mundine could have could have went so many different paths like he had the world at his feet yeah you know he really did like with football there was money being thrown like crazy at as an athlete in boxing, he he's, he has done so much. Absolutely. But mm. I do 110 million percent understand yeah. why he can't give it up. Yeah. I understand it. It's hard because I've, I've had the thoughts myself. People have said to me, give it up when I had my baby. Mm. I was never meant to come back. I ended up having a cesarean and fought 12 weeks later just because people couldn't tell me. 12 I weeks. <laughs> Because people <laughs> told me I couldn't do it. Well, they say that you shouldn't drive for six weeks. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Yeah. I, anyway. I fought twelve weeks after my, my cesarean and, yep. and literally because people said I couldn't do it. So I won? completely yeah. Yeah, cool. I completely understand that why he keep, he keeps going. It's hard to give up. Yeah. And like I said, I don't know who I am when I'm not shotgun, so maybe he's the same. Maybe so. When, when he's not chock, who is he? Yeah, maybe so. Because yeah, like uh, yeah, he's he's still an athlete. Yeah. So that's the other part. Like he's still And he's so athletic. I take guys to spar him all the time and I'm yep. just like, whoa. He's still got it. Do you know how old he is? 42. Four. Okay. Think, yeah. Yeah, because tell me about this. Mike Tyson. What do you think of his comeback? Because uh, he's 54. Yeah, I don't know. It, look, he's fighting someone that's also old, so... So that's a pairing. Look, I'm going to watch. Yeah. I don't... I, I feel like if we were allowed to go to America at the moment, I would go just so that it would be the only time you'd ever see two all-time greats in the ring at yep. the same time. Will I be fighting when I'm 54? No. No. I don't think so. I don't know. A his big puncher, I feel like, I don't know. Mm. But in saying that, Jeff Fennick did it. And, I mean, he's fine. Yeah, he's fine. So yeah. it, it's it's definitely an interesting one. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Um, a- another, another thing, you just don't know what Mike Tyson's mental health was like before. You know, maybe mm. he's gotten into... Mental health is a big thing with boxing. Mm. Um, maybe he got back into boxing because he needed something to focus on. Who knows? You, no one probably will ever know. Yep. But um, mental health is a big thing for boxing. Is that because the dedication and the discipline involved? The focus. Takes all your, that's what I was about to say. Takes yep. all your focus. Hey? It takes all your focus. You, 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 the, uh, the way I work, yep. and I, I'm assuming a lot, of, a lot of boxers are the same, probably, possibly a lot of athletes are the same, if I'm having like the worst, if my life is just going down and down and down, I train and train and train. Mm-hmm. I train, I, when I first moved to Queensland, I cried myself to sleep nearly every night. I trained myself into the ground until all I wanted to do was sleep and then I'd wake up and then I'd train again and, and that's how I became who I am. Mm. Eventually, I started to like Queensland. So <laughs> I'm still here and I probably would never go back to Adelaide even when I had that choice, but that's yep. how I got through it. So, you know, you, you just don't know what people are going through. And, and I think, um, like, you know, the different athletes I've spoken to and that as well along the way is the chatter. It just quietens everything down. Yeah. The more training you do, everything just quietens down. Yep, absolutely. So what do you see out of boxing for your future? Do, do you see yourself going to be a trainer, like, at some point? I am a trainer. I, I do own a boxing gym. But just full-time? Like, uh, as, would eventually, you do that way? Yeah. Eventually, yes, um, because other than my personal like being being an athlete yep. my gym is my full-time job yep. um so once i give that away then i'll obviously have a lot more time to put into my gym um short term i'm hoping to get a couple more belts yep. i've got um three world titles in two divisions i'm hoping for a third world title in a a, a fourth world title in a third division i'm, I'm dropping down to bantamweight now and i i want a world title in it i, I i'm pretty hell bent on getting a world title so w- where would you have to go what would you have to do to do that i don't know at the moment there's um ebony bridges in, in new south wales is about to fight for the world title that i wanted to fight for yep um hopefully if she wins it she'll defend it against me hopefully she has no choice because i know that if it's her choice she won't mm. um but yeah i mean there, there is there is opportunities out there and you know i've had i've had three solid wins in a row 
if I get my if I've got a fight coming up in December if I win that one hopefully it's going to get me up there in the rankings enough that we can really push for a world title and to be able to bring it to Australia would be amazing but I've fought around the world before I'll do it again why would Ebony not fight um look she's only had four fights and um, my management has spoken to her management. They said she wants to fight me in a few fights time, but she's not ready yet. Personally, mm-hmm. I think weird that she's fighting for a world title. So she's able to, if she wins, she'll be able to say that she's the best in the world. Yet she's not ready to fight me. Mm. Um, that makes no sense to me. But again, money talks. So I'm hoping that she either wins it if she doesn't want to fight me for it, she relinquishes it. I can fight for a vacant world title against someone that's equally as worthy or she'll fight me for it. Yep. I'm well, hoping if she wins it, she wins it in a in a fashionable style so that she gets a bit of confidence. And can <laughs> and can come back and fight you for it. Yeah. Yep. And that, that'll be a local fight, an Australia fight. Well, you would hope so. Yep. I mean, she, her management is America, UK, so who knows? I mean, you just don't know what she's doing. Mm. So your gym... Let's talk about that. Why did you, why did you open up shotgun boxing? I opened up shotgun boxing because um, because of my childhood. Because mm-hmm. I wanted to give other people that were having issues with life an outlet. Mm. Um, if I I mean yes, I have overheads, I have bills, I have I have rent to pay. If I could train everybody for free and give everyone that outlet that that some people really need. I would, Mm -hmm. but yes, I I do have fees. Um, So I I just want to be able to give people that, like mainly troubled youths. You know, I was a troubled youth. I didn't have an outlet. So if I can give that to someone, if I can tell my story to someone, I've always said from the day, from the day I started to become successful, um, if I can tell my story to one person and it changed their lives, then everything I went through was worth it. And I sort of feel the same thing about my gym. If I can, I, I do know that I've had members in my gym that have said, you, like I was suicidal and I didn't even know. Wow. But and you've coming been with them. to training every day yeah. and getting pushed and pushed and, and, and achieving goals has gotten them to a better mental level. Wow, that, that's huge, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got one girl actually, she's, she's actually just given birth to a baby and, and she had an eating disorder. Mm. Um, she fell pregnant and like, you know, she was, she's 18, 19, 18, I think she was, um, in and out of the gym, probably more so because her mum made her, hated being there, hated exercise, became pregnant, probably one of the most dedicated girls in my gym now. And she loves it. She's healthy. She's, she, she, I mean, she's come from having an eating disorder to loving the gym and now she's just had a baby and, and everyone's healthy. Pretty um, so, yeah. Pretty incredible turnaround, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. What's what's the average training for for someone in your gym? Um, so what like, happens? Depends. Like our fighters yep. train for an hour a day, um, and and it's you know a lot of shadow boxing, a lot of partner work, bag work. I try, I do try and mix it up a lot because boxing is very repetitive. Mm-hmm. Um, it's boring, but you have to be repetitive to get perfect at something. Um, I do try and mix it up a lot though to make it less boring for people. Um, I, I, I do run fitness classes as well mm-hmm. um, and same thing. I, it's, it's Boxing is boxing so there's not that much different things that you can do but I do try and make, mix it up a bit but I, it's more, you know, I spend, my, I spend my weekends trying to get my boys sparring with other gyms and, and getting them ready to, if they want to fight, they, they can fight. If they don't want to fight, that's fine. You, some some kids might want to come in and learn. They want to be good enough to fight. They just don't want to fight. Because mm. there is definitely like my, my best friend. He um he's done one fight. Yep. Um he always wanted to, he always wanted to be a boxer. He did one fight and he said that's not for me. But he went and he still continued on the training. Yep. There is a difference, isn't there? Yeah, you know, absolutely. There's a person that can actually do it, and then there's a person that wants to train to do it. I've also had um even just recently I've had a few people like you know they they're so super keen and yep. and then they want to get in they they buy their headgear they buy mouth guards they buy sixteen ounce gloves they get in they spar and then they never come back. Really. And I mean when I and when when I say spar like I'm talking. I don't put in I don't I don't allow people in my gym to bash each other. Yeah. If there's ever hard sparring, it's because it's even. Yeah. Like I have hard sparring in my gym because 
the girl that I'm sparring is as good as giving giving as good as she's taking yep. um but i don't ever let it be one-sided so um some people are just not made for it some people think they're made for it they're just not made for it but that's fine you don't have to be a fighter to be part of my gym mm, makes sense combat sports like did you ever think about turning your hand at like a ufc sort of style or anything i have been asked so many times mm. i'm the biggest boxing snob you'll ever meet. Yeah, okay. yep. <laughs> I don't know. I like. I, I don't mind watching UFC and I don't like all the ground stuff. I feel like I'd get claustrophobic and I'd yep. probably want to bite someone. Um, but it's not for me. I don't dislike it. Yep. It's just not for me. Um, I like the perfectionist side of boxing. Yep. I feel like um, Muay Thai, MMA, they've all got so many different things to work on that they can't perfect anything whereas we've got two weapons we, we've there's so many different things like you know um i remember watching the costa zoo dvd when i when my my b oldest son was little he was obsessed yep. and you know like it, it comes down to a millimeter of your punch changing or your head moving and that's the thing about boxing that i love is that it's perfecting things yep. and and i can sit there you know i've been boxing for 17 years and i can sit there in front of a mirror for a whole session and shadow box and throw two different punches for a whole session and it's just about perfecting those two punches it's the pure yeah the purest part of like fighting sport yeah it? where can people find you find you online and find your gym online um i so probably the best part best thing is um it's social media so i'm yep. instagram it's shotgun boxing or my personal page is shotgun 78 um Facebook is Shotgun Shannon O'Connell or Shotgun Boxing and Fitness. But my actual gym is on Herbert Street in Slacks Creek. Awesome. No worries. Well, I'll put something up in our, um, our Instagram and everything as well. Uh, I can't wait to see your fight later in the year. Yes. Should be awesome. Thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. And I just, yeah, um, yeah, just incredible to sit down with you and just hear about some of the things. You've had an incredible life. Thank you. And, um, yeah, catch you around. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having Shannon. me.